Hello and welcome to Law Pod. I'm Lauren Dempster. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Law at Queen's University Belfast and director of Law Pod. I'm Kevin Hardy, a lecturer in criminology at Queen's University Belfast. I'm, I'm Brian Dooley. I'm a guest on this podcast. Thank you very much. And I'm senior advisor at the uh, Washington based NGO Human Rights First, and I'm also an honorary professor of practice at the Mitchell Institute uh, at Queen's. Thank you very much, Brian, for joining us today. We are here to talk about a report that Brian was involved in developing called Bitter Legacy, State Impunity and the Northern Ireland Conflict. Can you tell us a little bit about the report and your role in relation to that report? Yes, sure. Thank you again for having me. So I work for Human Rights First. For people who are old enough might remember it as the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. And we've been involved as an organisation in issues uh, really around attacks on human rights lawyers in Northern Ireland. Since the late 80s, the Pat Finucane and and Rosemary Nelson murders and then uh, threats and other challenges to human rights lawyers in in Northern Ireland since then. Uh, And so this is always part of our work for decades, the idea of people being attacked and then not being adequately prosecuted, that there'd been no real follow-up by the, the criminal justice system. And so we were approached along with others by the Norwegian Centre for Human Rights a couple of years ago. Because there had been, you know, conversations swirling around really since the end of the conflict because the Good Friday Agreement didn't allow for any overarching mechanism to to deal with these issues of impunity and unsolved crimes. Uh, And so the Oslo-based Norwegian Centre for Human Rights was approached by some NGOs uh, in Belfast and Derry, the Committee on the Administration of Justice and and the Pat Fanukan Centre, uh, really for a discussion about you know what what could possibly be done to try to address some substantial research into the whole issue of impunity. So the the Norwegian Centre put together a panel of what they call international experts from Ireland, from Argentina, uh, originally from South Africa, although uh, Yasmin then had had to drop out from from Norway and from Israel. Each of the panel members bring in a certain relevant expertise. Uh, and so we we divided up the the study, which turned out really to be to pretty pretty long, substantial uh, study, a report of two hundred or so pages, into three main areas to look at in terms of impunity. One was around killings, uh, one was around torture and ill treatment, and the third, which is sort of ha- harder to get a, a hold of, but was around the issue of collusion. And so we looked at each of those and tried not to write a history of killings or torture during the conflict or collusion during the conflict, but whether or not there appeared to be impunity for those crimes and whether or not, for instance, torture had been investigated or the killings had been investigated, collusion had been properly uh, prosecuted, investigated or not. That was our remit really to look at the impunity aspects of these things. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Brian. So obviously, as you mentioned there, it's it's a big team and that brings with it different forms of expertise. So I wonder if you could say a bit more about some of the advantages and also perhaps the challenges or limitations of working with a big team. Well, I am old enough to have never experienced a group project before, group work. I know it's all the rage now uh, in academia and I, I had never done it before, so it was all very new to me. Um, and so working with the Fano panelists uh, was really a very different experience for me. I mean, these people, you know, the two, two policing experts from Norway brought in an expertise that you know, I, I really knew very little about. Uh, Maria Jose from, uh, from Argentina is an expert on victims' rights and how you involve people in, uh, in transitional justice. And, and Ifa Duffy, who's based at the University of Essex now, uh, is, a, is an expert on torture. Um, Ron Dudai from an, uh, a university in Israel uh, is an expert on uh, informers in uh, paramilitaries in Northern Ireland. And so you had all of these people really knowing a lot about their specific area. Um, that was great. Um, some of the challenges are, you know, we, we're just based in different countries, different time zones, different first languages. Uh, we were backed by uh, an, an enormously efficient engine of researchers, uh, postgrads from Queens, from Essex, from, from Georgetown University in America helped with me, from the Norwegian Centre, um, the Oslo Law School. Uh, and so they, they really did a lot of the, the detailed research. And 
there are a huge amount of recently declassified documents from the British government. Uh, and going through those, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages uh, was was one enormous challenge. Um, my organization I developed a, um, a sophisticated search engine to be able to, to go through those documents. But even so, it, it was a lot of work. And then, of course, we all went to Northern Ireland at various times. I mean, the, the, the team was sort of split into sub-teams uh, and interviewed survivors, families of victims, former true prisoners, officials of the British government and others. Uh, and so it, it was an enormous project. I think we're all pretty proud of how it turned out. I think it took longer than we'd originally anticipated. I mean, really, it took two years. But yeah, working with people in different time zones and, and all with their own jobs to do. I mean, none of us was working on this full time, right? So, you know, these people are away lecturing or, the, or they're being lawyers or the, whatever else they do. Uh, and so, it, it, yeah, it was a big challenge. Thanks, Brian. It's really fascinating to hear more about how these projects work. Basically, you've talked about the focus of this report, but could you just tell us what prompted it at this stage? So why now, I guess, in terms of this particular report? Well, I think as the project went on, it you know, the, the, the shadow of uh, legislation, which eventually came to pass in terms of the, the Legacy Act, w- was always there, and it actually grew stronger as time went on. Um, so there were a couple of factors. We, we didn't do the project just because there was talk of legislation, but it was, it was always there hovering in the background. Um, one of the other factors of, of why now is time's really getting on. I mean, I've been working on, you know, researching some of these issues in, in a fairly peripheral way, um, working with some of the human rights lawyers in Belfast and elsewhere, and I'd looked at one or two cases myself, particularly the, the killings at Spring Hill, West Rock. Um, and I could see, you know, some of the, some of the, the survivors, some of the witnesses uh, are just getting old and dying, frankly. I mean, some of these crimes took place more than 50 years ago. And so there was a sort of an urgency to try to talk to people when we could. That was one factor. The legislation was another factor. And then, you know, there, there was also a conversation I guess about the truth what had really happened you know there were voices from Britain saying that there was a witch hunt against former soldiers a few cases had come to some sort of resolution the uh, the coroner's inquest into what happened at Ballymurphy for instance when 11 people were killed and were, were found to be innocent um, the Kathleen Thompson case in Derry was a woman an unarmed woman was killed by a, a British soldier too was was going through the process and then also some of the other cases around Bloody Sunday, Soldier F, was he ever going to get into court? Was it going to be a real prosecution? So several of these things came together a couple of years ago um, and really lots of unanswered questions. And, and, you know, it's important for me to say we never thought we could answer the questions. I mean, what we were trying to do, were, I guess, was to reframe the questions in a, in a more useful way with an attempt to make an, an overarching uh, a view or an overarching approach to really what are thousands and thousands of different cases, but what, what are their killings or their torture or their collusion? Thank you, Brian. Uh, I'm going to ha- hand over to Kevin um, shortly, but just to mention for our listeners that we will put um, a link to the report in our show notes for anyone who wants to look at the report in full. It's a really significant and um, timely piece of work. So Kevin, I'm going to hand over to you. So I've actually read the report, Brian, and it's a substantive piece of work, and it really it focuses on state killings, torture, and uh, annual treatment, and collusion. Maybe for the listeners who might not be uh, familiar, can you please provide a sense of the scale and nature of these harms during the conflict in the North, please? Yes, thanks very much, Kevin. I, I, I think it's important also to explain why we focused on state killings and torture by the state as opposed to by paramilitary groups, although there is some overlap there that I'll, that I'll come to. Generally speaking, when somebody was, uh, let's say, killed by a paramilitary group, there was, generally speaking, some real effort by the security forces to find out who had done it. There was usually a proper police investigation, prosecution. We know around 30,000 people went to prison uh, during the conflict for paramilitary related activities. So while there are certainly cases there that are unsolved, there was 
by and large, a bona fide attempt by the authorities to find out who had committed those crimes. However, when uh, it appeared that the uh, the killers were from the state, the police or soldiers, there by and large was not a good faith attempt to find out who had done it or to prosecute them. So we found that at least 370 people had been killed by the state. Most were civilians, most were unarmed, and there had been very few prosecutions or even real investigations into who had done these things. So led by our policing experts from, from Norway, they looked into dozens of these cases in, in some detail and found that the investigations were usually pretty perfunctory that you know here and there a witness had been interviewed but alibis weren't followed up there'd been some photos taken but there hadn't been proper uh, searches of people's houses and so on and so there was a gap if you like uh, an impunity gap we saw that for the the families of victims who'd been killed by somebody representing the british state they very rarely got any sort of justice or, or, or truth about what happened the complication comes in around collusion, where many people, and again, nobody knows, were killed or injured. And we really only focused on, on the killings because the injured w were so many more cases. But where somebody was killed by a member of a paramilitary group, but that person was at the same time as being a member of a paramilitary group, also an informant, an agent of the state, then we found in case after case after case after case that they were not properly investigated or prosecuted either. So we, we count that as a state responsibility too. And so the impunity for, for state crimes that, that was clear to us. In terms of the scale of things, like I say, there was, you know, 370 or so plus killings by, um, by state actors, plus then an unknown number of, of killings by paramilitaries who were also British agents or informants. We found plenty of examples of those, but we don't have a, a definitive total. In terms of the number of people tortured and mistreated in custody, it nearly always happened in custody. Again, hard to know the numbers because you know, some people just went into, went into a police station, in, particularly in the, in the early 70s, were beaten up, possibly were tortured, came out, never told anybody about it. And so that went totally unrecorded. But we're certainly talking hundreds, and, and I, I would say thousands of people who'd been tortured during the course of the conflict by officials of the state, by the police or, or soldiers. Uh, when it comes to the scale of collusion, really very, very difficult to even make an educated guess. And so when it, when it came to examining the evidence of collusion, we, we stuck very closely to official reports by the police ombudsman, by coroners, occasionally by judges in, in court cases, criminal court cases, and really went through all of their statements to find out where they had complained about collusion. You know, there have, there have been some, some inquiries which had been uh, commissioned by various British governments, often led by re retired judges or, or senior legal officials, De Silva, Corrie, and so on. Uh, and they'd also complained about cases of collusion. So that's what we base their evidence on, not on conspiracy theories or, or, or stories from the media or stories from families. Uh, the collusion stuff is, is very, very sensitive to, to try and research and to draw any conclusions from. And so we stuck very heavily to really what the British authorities had already said themselves. That's it's interesting, that kind of um, methodological problem that, that you speak about there. But uh, another interesting I guess aspect of it is the context in uh, which that the the report materialised. The report came in the aftermath of the UK passing the Troubles and Reconciliation Act, which, as many have said, is tantamount to uh, an amnesty. Could you share your thoughts on that legislation and its potential impact in terms of impunity, please? Yes. Now, I understand that you are a legal-based podcast, so I apologise in advance here, and, and I know that my lawyer colleagues don't necessarily agree with this approach. My uh, problem with the new legislation, the, the Legacy Act that, that came into force on May the 1st, is not so much that it contravenes international law, although clearly it appears to. My problem is that it's not wanted in the area in Northern Ireland where it, it's supposed to apply. So I, 
I worked at Amnesty International in the early 90s, and I remember when the South African Post-Apartheid Truth and Reconciliation Commission was being set up. There was a lot of huffing and puffing by the policy wonks at Amnesty, by the legal mind, saying, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't comply with various international legal standards. And I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand it, it didn't. But for me, that was sort of okay. Like, it worked for society. It was what, by and large, society wanted. I, I have to say that its achievements, I think, have been, been overblown a bit. But it was, it was generally accepted and welcomed and done pretty well. Were that the case in Northern Ireland, was there broad support for this sort of legislation, then I would feel uncomfortable opposing it. But there isn't. You can find a few people here and there who think it's a good idea, but, you know, I mean, it, it, it's done the unusual feat of, of really uniting all of the major political parties against it. The Council of Europe's against it, UN experts are against it, the Labour Party promised in its manifesto to repeal it. The Irish government is so frustrated by it that it brought an interstate case against the British. Very rare. It's only done it once before in the early 70s in the case of the, the torture of the, the hooded men. It's brought a case against the British government to the European Court of Human Rights. So one of the most controversial aspects of it, although there are lots of problems with the, with the Act, is that it, it intended to give a form of amnesty immunity to people who came forward, perpetrators who came forward, and if they said, look, I'm telling the truth here, and the, uh, the commission set up by the new body said, yeah, we think you're telling the truth, they would be uh, absolved from any sort of prosecution. Now, that provision of it has been found to be illegal uh, by the court, but as we understand it, the British authorities are contemplating an appeal to that, so it's possible that it would be back in. But that was just one of the problems with it. I mean, another of the problems is that it shuts down all of the other avenues which had until now been open uh, to families and survivors. So we'd seen a, you know, a series of uh, coroner's inquests, which I think even at best aren't fully satisfying for families. I mean, a coroner can basically say that a killing was you know, unjustified or, or, or justified, and it, it, it can't prosecute the perpetrator. But it was a lot better than nothing for many families, and many families wanted such an inquest. Some got it. Some were beaten by the clock in that their inquests had, had started, but then May the 1st, the guillotine came down this year, and so they're never going to get the verdict on that. And there were plenty of other families in the queue who never even got the first day in court, in a coroner's court. Uh, so that's also one of the, the, the major problems with this act, quite apart from the amnesty immunity thing. But overall, I think the, the problem is that the families we spoke to, and we spoke to many families of people who'd been killed, we spoke to many people who'd been tortured, none of the families that we spoke to thought that this act was a good idea. And for me, that's what's telling. I mean, yeah, you can measure, you know, the, the British government's record and its attempt to justify how it complied with the European Convention on Human Rights and yes, you know, its investigations met the standards laid out in Article 2 and, and Article 3. But this new act appears not to be able really to, to fulfill what, what families want, which is, you know, what happened, who did it and why did it happen? Thanks, Brian. Um, it was really interesting to hear your reflections. Kevin and I are both transitional justice scholars and we so often talk about victim centeredness and, you know, the point you're making about this piece of legislation being so widely opposed uh, across Northern Ireland has really been extremely difficult to see, especially knowing, as you know yourself, like how many decades some families and, and survivors of the conflict here have campaigned for. So I wanted to, as I said, for our listeners, we'll put the full report in the show notes, but the report comes to the conclusion that state impunity in Northern Ireland is widespread, systematic and systemic. And that will not be surprising to some, but it is still a very devastating conclusion. Um, can you tell us why the panel came to this conclusion? Yes, thank you. So over the months and months of, of discussion that we had between the panel members, we were always figuring out, well, how are we going to describe really the scope of what happened? You know, over the years various people have said yes there were some things that went wrong it was all very difficult it was an intensive conflict you're bound to get you know a few bad apples so we were trying to figure out you know if if we're saying that it's not a few bad apples that it's more than that what is it 
And then we started to use sort of everyday language about, you know, there's a pattern of this or such and such is a common practice or there was institutional failure. And then we realized that, you know, it would be a good idea really to have a, a verdict in each of the areas. So, you know, in, in the, in the context of killings and in the context of torture and in the context of collusion, what were our conclusions? And so we, we discussed various terms. Uh, which had been used and defined before in international human rights inquiries. And the three then that we decided that, that were most appropriate were the determinations about were these things widespread in every case of the three contexts, were they systematic and were they systemic? And so we examined each of the three contexts, applied them against each of those three definitions and found that in all of them, all of the the context applied to all of the descriptions. So that that was a that was a long debate because we wanted to be sure that we were getting that right. I mean, in everyday language, you know, people throw out these words. Um, I'm I'm sure I've done it myself. You know, it's such and such is systematic or such and such is widespread. And what does widespread mean? And you know, you have to you have to look back at, at well some of the other uh, UN mechanisms, for instance, are described around Rwanda or or some other contexts. And does that really apply here? Anyway, in the end, we, we debated and we debated, got into it actually in, at a fairly deep level and decided that, yes, it, it, was, it was right and justified to say that in the case of killings and torture and collusion, impunity was widespread, systematic and systemic. And, and one other thing I just want to pick up on there, as you asked me that question, which was a lot of what has happened in terms of you know partial successes of getting these cases in front of coroner's courts or very occasionally in in a criminal court has happened after years and sometimes many decades of families campaigning and we sort of take that because it's true to be normal but it's not normal it shouldn't be left to the families it shouldn't be left to the survivors uh, of these crimes to have to do the campaigning themselves and I mean, we've met many of these families and, you know, many of them are, are exhausted. They've been doing this for 50 or more years. They have been dismissed. They've been disbelieved. They've been denigrated and vilified and they've kept going and they shouldn't have had to put up with all of that for decades and decades. And so this is perhaps the first hurdle where a success is a um, number of British governments, more than a dozen uh, British governments, have failed that they did not do these investigations, inquiries themselves. And, and, and finding the evidence, finding the witnesses has been left wrongly to families to do. And it, it's one of those things that you hear it so many times. Oh, now we're meeting, you know, the family of a campaign of, of such and such. And, and you sort of get used to it, but you shouldn't. It's not right. It's not right. It should have been the, the police that, doing, that were doing these investigations properly and thoroughly at the time. So just to, to follow on what you said there, Brian, and the very relevant and pertinent point about families having campaigned for, for decades. I mean, we've we've seen efforts to challenge impunity in the North before. You know, we've had the campaigns by victims and survivors. We've had legal action taken by victims and survivors. We've had, you know, uh, the UK government responding with what they refer to as a package of measures. We've had, you know, previous CAG reports about the apparatus of, of impunity from 2015. Despite all of these efforts, Impunity has continued and arguably been institutionalized further through the, the recent legislation that we discussed. So in that context, what is your hope for this report in terms of prompt and change? Well, I, I think at best the report can be a substantial, a hefty piece of evidence, a persuasive piece of evidence that there really has been widespread systematic, systemic impunity and tackling it with the sort of legislation which is currently in law won't work. I think you have to think much bigger. I think one of the good things, I guess, that's happened, and you'll know more about this than me in terms of transitional justice, is there's a better understanding now of how you involve families in these processes. And so I think there are some decent models from around the world. One of my fellow panelists, uh, Maria Jose from Argentina, really, really knows this world inside out. And so I don't think it's impossible for there to be an internationally independent commission of inquiry into various themes about what happened during the conflict 
I mean, back in 2014, you know, the Stormont House Agreement, which was agreed to by the big players, would have been much better than what we ended up with. It, it wasn't really followed through on. And so there, there was the, the makings there of something much better. But, you know, every, every year that goes past, more people die. I mean, that, that, that's just true. You know, people, people who were tortured die without ever seeing any sort of justice for what happened to them. Uh, family members die without ever really seeing uh, any justice for what happened to to their loved ones who were killed. So on, on one hand, I think, you know, you need, you need to get it right and you need to do it thoroughly, but also you need to do it fast. Uh, you need to do it quickly. And, you know, th those things are, are a little contradictory, but really the new act just sort of wastes time. I don't really think that it's going to be able to, to see through its remit or five years Certainly, it won't deliver the sort of satisfaction that most families want. So there has to be a something else. And I guess the something else, we could start looking back at the, the 2014 Stormont House Agreement um, for a basis, but really to look, to look bigger to uh, an independent international commission. And just finally, sort of the, the time aspect that you talk about, the passage of time is... Uh, interesting, but also uh, in terms of the timing around the introduction of the bill and what's going on now. So we are recording this podcast literally the day before people go to the polls in the general election. And we've seen that in all the efforts to date to address state violence, political will seems to be central. So as we look towards what follows on from whatever happens tomorrow uh, in the election, do you see any change on the horizon in terms of political will to challenge impunity in relation to the conflict here? I see more pressure on political will, which is slightly different. I mean, the Labour Party manifesto pledges to repeal uh, the act and to go back to something based on Thormont House. We'll see. I should also say that we also looked at cases in, in the South um, and not just, I mean, the, 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 the one that most people know about happened 50 years ago and, and bombings in, in Dublin and Monaghan uh, in May of uh, 1974, but there were half a dozen or more other attacks, killings too, where there was strong evidence of collusion. And the Irish government, I have to say, has also failed those families over the years, not pressing hard enough for investigations. I do think that the, the prominence of these cases, thanks largely to the, the families and the NGOs which work with them, is making a difference, and I think also partly prompted the the legislation. I mean, if the families hadn't made the fuss and they hadn't managed to bring convincing evidence into the coroner's courts, and you hadn't had these embarrassing coroner's verdicts against the British security forces, then there may not have been the need for this legislation. So in a weird way, I think the legislation is sort of a mark of uh, a byproduct, I guess, of the success of the families campaigning. And I do see that getting stronger. I think the families are getting more sophisticated in their campaigning, their understanding, what counts as evidence, how to find the evidence. And so I think the pressure will be greater. I don't like that this is true either, but I think it is true that in some ways for the, for the British government, the more time that passes, the easier it is for them to, to tell the truth, to accept responsibility, perhaps. You know, one of the pressures on the British government clearly are, are former soldiers who don't want to be brought to court. Those soldiers are also older and, and dying. Well, you know, there has been a, an apology for Bloody Sunday. Now, all of the, the actors involved there are not dead, but many of them are, particularly the higher ups. So an optimistic reading, I guess, would be that, yeah, more evidence is coming out of what really happened. It may be easier as time goes on for the British government to tell the truth and accept responsibility. Although, you know, it's, it still struggles to uh, accept its, its responsibility over slavery. So, who knows? So, that sounds like a good point to draw the podcast to a close. Thank you, Brian, for giving Kevin and I your time today. And thank you to all of you for listening.